I'm not sure how long my presentation is, hopefully not as long as my title. <laughs> Tom, Tom, the first thing he said to me was, yeah, we'd really um, like you to do your talk, but could you make your title a little bit shorter? And I was like, yeah, yeah oh, totally, definitely. And then I did not. Um, and then I saw um, Avery and Lynn were doing a talk first thing this morning that was um, you know, involving your client in your process. And I was like, oh, good title. And that's my talk. So, and and I, I went and they did a great talk. And it's not exactly the same. But this is almost maybe a good follow up to that talk. Um, so if you're in it, this hopefully won't be a repetition. And if you weren't in it, then it's all fresh and new. And I shouldn't have even mentioned them. Um, so uh, I'll first um, just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, and uh, Jem, one of my colleagues in my company, is in the audience. So routinely, Jem has to jump in and back me up, because I don't usually talk much about what we, who we are and what we do. However, um, there's my, uh, my email. Please email me after, or if you have any questions or want to do any follow-up. That's my Twitters, if you're doing the Twitters. Um, so I've been working in media for most of my career, but working specifically in digital media since about 2000. Um, uh, from a, a traditional media background at first, and then um, getting more and more into digital media management. Um, uh, I used to do more front-end coding back when we still used tables and stuff. So I love email newsletters. Um, but I kind of abandoned um, my knowledge of, of CSS and all that stuff uh, at that point. Um, but I'm currently relearning it because I'm teaching it at Centennial College. So they always say, if there's something that you want to learn, teach it. <laughs> and it is actually, it's a great way to refresh my knowledge. So I'm teaching um, in the Integrated Media Management Program at Centennial. So I'm mostly teaching UX, people who are going to end up being user experience designers, probably project managers, but just to get them familiar with um, front-end code and PHP and JavaScript. And we're going to be focusing on WordPress as our um, uh, what we're uh, going to be working with. Um, I have my own company. It's called Analytical Engine Interactive. We mostly do user experience design, content strategy, mostly working with clients in WordPress. We sometimes do Drupal. <laughs> Just waiting to see if there's going to be like a, oh, I knew there was going to be some kind of a smackdown. There's some kind of like <laughs> reprisals for using the D word. There was someone else in one of the other sessions who used the D word, and there was a bit of a gasp among the audience. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing my master's right now at OCAD U, and it's a master's of design, but it's really more, um, it's, uh, uh, we're looking at design thinking. So that's sort of the approach that I'm taking to this talk, is looking at design, um, some of the methodologies and the process um, that we use through a kind of a design thinking um, lens. So looking at design as problem solving or even sort of problem finding. Because we, we end up doing a lot of problem finding and that's um, why I had that sort of crazy long title. So you know, what do we mean by mashups that add value? So we often get hired to do web design. That's, that's what is in the tender document or that's what the um, People say they, they need. Um, and, and if we're really lucky, our clients will actually go a little bit further. And they'll describe a little bit the problem um, that they're uh, having. I, I've never been asked to do user experience design. Like, I've never had one single person say, we're looking for user experience design, um, which is actually what we call what we do. Um, but so usually, our, our beginning of our process is to sort of problem find and make sure that we're solving the right problem. Because often what, what web design really means is business process design. Sometimes it's more their digital business strategy overall that they're, that they're struggling with. Um, often what they're really looking for is content strategy uh, and, and usually marketing strategy as well, because most businesses and, and sort of average people who don't work in our field, their websites are, are primarily marketing tools for them. Um, so I, I don't say this to 
point to say that you know our clients are all idiots or something. Not at all. It's just that we don't share a language. Usually, we don't use the same words. Um, so um, we really always want to find out what what really is their need, what really is the problem that we're that we're solving, um, and that's where these three methodologies I'm going to walk you through, that's sort of where these have come from. These sort of have, we've evolved into using these methodologies um, in order to be able to really work very closely with our clients and really involve them in the process. Because there's a, this is a really great, I just saw this diagram for the first time like on Friday and I was like, oh my god, I have to include it in my, in my talk. This is a, the problem with doing a master's is everything I see in here now is relevant. <laughs> everything is about everything now. It's awful. I listen to the radio. I'm like, oh my god, that's so important for my design masters. But I thought this was a really great um, diagram, actually, because it, it really maps out that there's a lot of different things. When we say design, we actually mean a lot of different things. And honestly, often when you do web design for people, you're in this sort of expert mindset um, space. So we do a lot, or have been, doing a lot of um, this kind of design, like really thinking about human factors when it comes to the um, interaction design of the, of the <coughs> websites that we build. Um, you know, usability testing, like we do a lot of like user-centered design, it really kind of is in here, but more and more, I'm finding that we're trying, we're moving up that way a little bit. In terms of um, seeing our clients, not only the users, the end users, but our clients as partners in the design process. Um, because, you know, what you don't want to do is talk to your client up front and, you know, get a whole bunch of, of information and then walk away and then come back to them, you know, three weeks or six weeks later and say, all right, here's what we're going to do. Um, A, because you, you really might get it wrong, but also because they won't necessarily be bought in. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Going back to the previous yeah. the diagram, so is this how you um, position your company? Is that what you're using this for? Or, because it's really interesting. It's more, um, uh, yes and no. I mean, I'd be <laughs> go on my website and tell me if it's how I'm <laughs> sorry if it's how I'm positioning my company. I I kind of do, but honestly, people don't. Uh, it kind of goes back to what I said at the beginning, and actually, it's it's sort of relevant to this slide. There's a lot of what we do as designers that really does get lost in translation, like, um, and there's a lot of missed opportunities as well when you when you have more of that expert mindset like i am the designer i'm the web person i'm the digital person i know what's best for you i'm going to get a few you know tidbits from you and go away and come back with a solution you i think um, <laughs> so I, I love this uh, i love this lorem so this is corporate lorem which actually doesn't read like lorem <laughs> actually that could be kind of corporate speak, but then that's us over there, you know, the wacky design people doing like handstands on skateboards. <laughs> so we're saying this and they're saying this and sometimes there's just no um, crossover. So again, uh, which is why what I'm gonna kind of demo for you or case show you little sort of case studies, I guess, is just sort of these three methodologies that we really try to bring into our work that um, that really involve the client in a very hands-on way up front so we can really make sure that we are solving the right problem. Because usually the word that they know for what they need to do is the web design. That's usually what they think. We need a new website. Someone told us we need a new website. Our website sucks. Our website's old. We need a new website. But often they, they're struggling with content management or sometimes they're struggling with their internal business processes. Sometimes it's really like their content is just really... Um, bad. I shouldn't say bad. Yeah, sometimes it's bad. Let's just say it like it is. So, um, so we have all these practices that we would normally um, use in user experience design. Uh, how many people are, are user experience designers in the room that you would say you're like UX kind of people? How many people are like web designers? 
I mean, you're, you probably, there's a lot of crossover. Um, because uh, honestly, whenever you're designing anything, you're, you're, you're always, um, you are problem solving. You're, whether it's a, a very specific you know, problem of a, li a little piece of interactivity or the way a button works or to a, a bigger um, kind of a strategic issue. So we've taken some um, UX practices and we've kind of pimped them. Thus the wacky, pimp my UX practices font and slide. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is, um, is card sorting. So um, the, the main way that I've used card sorting in the past has been, well, a couple of things. One is often you do a card sorting exercise to figure out the information architecture on your website. So you'll have a, get all the topics that is on their current website, and you put them on a card, and then you get, peep, you get your client, or you get users usually to sort them in different ways. Has anyone done a card sort to, to kind of figure out your navigation? So you do that. Another way that we've used um, uh, kind of a, an affinity diagramming process is uh, for sure in user testing. So we did a lot of user testing. We, uh, I used to work at TVO, and we did a huge redesign on the website. We did a lot of user testing. So we set up a lab, we videotaped people, and we had people come in and test the website. And we had all of our, our, our designers and a couple of developers in another room just writing down every time they saw an issue, every time they saw someone struggling with something. And then we'd all get together with all our sticky notes and we'd affinity diagram them. We'd stick them all up and put them together into clusters and try to prioritize issues in that way. So card sorting and affinity diagram, what we now do, we've kind of mashed these up into a brand identity exercise with clients. So I didn't make this up. I actually totally stole this from Margot Bloomstein, um, who's a really great content strategist. Um, so what we do, and I brought my cards, so I can even pass them around. You can have a look. Why don't I do that? I, oh, I can walk away. I'm wireless. So just so you see what, they're just super simple. They're like index cards with words written on them, adjectives. So I give this stack of cards to the client. And sometimes it's one person, and sometimes it's um, a whole team. And uh, we spread them all out on the table. And I just tell them, OK, sort these words into groups. Um, so they sort the words into groups. And then I'll say, OK, pick the word in that group that's like the leader of the group. And they pick the leader of the group. And then usually what I do is I hide all the other cards and just have the leader cards. And then I say, OK, tell me, of all these, these now subset, these words that we've gotten down on the table, which one describes who you are right now as a business, as a brand, but usually you know, often we're just working with small business people. So it's like, as a business. And then who do you want to be? And who are you absolutely not? So these become really, really useful for design. I mean, just for knowing what is the, the going to be the look and feel and um, the character of the content, the character of the brand. It's, it's super helpful for us for like a messaging architecture. Um, but it's an amazingly valuable exercise to go through with a client. It's like the best 60 minutes I usually spend with a client. Did you have a question? Yeah, well, it's a great idea. Do you find that your customers react to this in the way they want to be seen or the way they um, actually are seen? Well, they get to say, um, they get to say both. So they, it's, it's uh, usually it's, coming from the inside. So it usually ends up being, here's who we are. And they, they usually know where they have, well, they don't always. But they, you, you sort of take it as it is. Because even if you don't agree, it's very interesting to see. Like What, uh, what comes out of this for me is the outcome is important. These photos of cards, this is useful and important, and I use it. The, the process is even more important because I, I get to listen in on a conversation that they have among themselves where there's disagreements. They Sometimes they don't even define the same words in the same way. It's quite interesting 
as a, as a designer, like a, an ethnographic, from a kind of a social science per perspective, to, to listen in on the conversation. And sometimes, even if it's just a single client, it's really interesting to see how they think about their business and how they think about their brand. And um, so it may not end up being completely accurate in any kind of an objective sense. It's more social than science. but. That's a good question. So it honestly depends who hires us. So if we get hired by the marketing people, um, sometimes that's not a good thing because we're kind of already speaking the same language. Um, so sometimes we can't get really underneath and figure out what is the sort of the problem they're having. But I try to make it a team of stakeholders. So. Um, we just did a fairly large project, or we're still in the midst of it, for a media company. So I had their editorial people in the room, their marketing people. They brought in some people from their ad sales force and some people from their board. So it was a fairly big group. So that was interesting. That took a long time. And it was very interesting to stand back and hear. You really get a good sense of like the political landscape on the project in terms of who has the real power. and, and and all of that kind of stuff is super interesting. Whereas on another project, if it's a, it's a small business run by a couple, I just do it with, with the, the two of them. Totally. Nope, same set of cards. Absolutely. Because you want to see where, you want to hear what they talk about. Like you want to hear where they disagree, where they agree. And then when it gets to the point of, of who they want to be, that's really critical. And how they see themselves, like who they are. It's just, uh, uh, like I usually, if I, if I don't audio tape the session, I'm usually making tons of notes while they're doing it. Just like reflections on things. I'll, I'll go here and then here. Um, the words themselves, were they, are they industry specific? They're just, no, they're just adjectives. It's just, I think I, I've been building them over the years. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people will be like, there's a word that's not here, and we'll add it. Like in this one, he really wanted wholesome. I didn't have it. Personality traits, really. Yeah, the, well, yeah, they're adjectives. They, yeah, I mean, yeah, they're, they're, I'm passing the cards around. And I have a small set and a big set. I think I originally started, I went on a website and typed, you know, I went on and just said adjectives. And I wrote them all down, one per card. And um, Margot Bloomstein uh, talks about this as a, she, this is the way she kicks off specifically content strategy, um, because it's amazingly helpful when you when you do like a message architecture for a client. Because we do a lot of content strategy work, um, and what would be the message architecture is kind of like the wireframe of their content. Um, yeah, you, you get um, some pretty deep insights about them. So does this almost become a form of a wireframing for your project in terms of the, the ideas that are flowing around how I'm going to get this on a screen now? Do you bring them back to this? Um, later, later, I, no, we're way over here. And, well, this is what's I would, doing. yeah, I would you definitely include this in the design document for sure. Um, and it, it definitely impacts on two things, the visual design um, and the kind of the way the brand expresses itself um, visually, but also in the, um, uh, as I said, in like the messaging architecture um, in the content. Um, and I, I, I think what's also interesting about this, has anyone ever done like a coaching session where you went with a coach? I did a, a coaching session with this guy. He was a great coach. But I, when I left the session, I was like, I feel like I, I really got someplace. But he didn't do any talking. Like, he just asked me a question at the beginning of the hour. And then I just like rambled on and on and gauged his reaction and had insights. And like, usually the problem that your client is having, they know it. So all of these methodologies are kind of ways of getting them to come to the conclusions that will help you 
come to the same conclusions so that there's no surprises. They're bought into the process and um, along the way. I would think, though, that uh, in, particularly in certain uh, uh, organizational contexts, there may be suppression that, that you're working against, more or less. Uh, if you have board members, for example, in the room, they may not want to hear certain things, and that those would then get cleared out of the, uh, of the discussion and, and so forth. True or false? Yeah, that, that's true. So it could be, uh, you know, it could be that in a way we got lucky with the team where we had quite a bunch of people because everyone was very, were, there were a lot of strong voices at the table. Um, but honestly, I, I haven't really found that so much. Like usually they're about to invest a fair bit of money in a, you know, and, and it, it, for them it's always a fair bit of money in a, in a process and they want to come out of it with something really useful and really valuable. Usually people are ready to do this and often I don't just throw it at them first thing when I walk in the door. It usually comes at the end of a kickoff meeting where we've done some other work. I'm just wondering would you also recommend, I find the disconnect is with who you're working with at the organization and then once you produce some work, they now decide, yeah, now we're going to share it with some other people and they look at it and go, no, that's not where we're coming from. So once you've completed this process, you may recommend to them now share it amongst yourselves with the people who weren't at the meeting and say, are we all on the same page here? Yeah, on, yeah. Part of, so this is only one methodology. So one of the next, not the next one, but the next one. Well, they're all intended to, um, you know, at a kind of a meta level, you want to make sure you're talking to the right people in the organization. And sometimes you do need to get past that gatekeeper. I always, um, usually when we're working on websites for people, yeah, the front end is important, but the back end is often more important. And Avery and Lynn said that too, like they, they spent a lot of time showing their client the back end, like the content management. That's usually, honestly, those business processes are usually more important. Um, so we, I always try to get to talk to the people on the ground who are gonna be like doing the content management, the webmasters, the, marketing people like that are doing the w actual work. Um, but yeah, I mean, off, sometimes you need to get beyond the gate. But often, we're, uh, sometimes we're also working with very small businesses. And um, so interesting. It's so psychological um, because I think about It's so funny, I've done this, I've done a, a frequent, like three in a row sort of over the last few months with three different clients. It's been totally different, totally, like it's so personal, especially when it's a small business, like uh, if it's a couple and they've been running this business for 15 years and it's like their child. Um, I did a one with another gentleman and um, a lot of it was wrapped up in lifestyle issues for him. So yeah, he knows he needs a website, but he doesn't want to be a slave to his website. And that really came through in the card sort. Like, this might be his. Oh, I'm not sure whose this is. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty kind of deep stuff. But it's, um, it, 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 develops a relationship of trust, which is really important. Um, and it's more generative, like it's more of a participatory process. So you, you get buy-in, you, you get people bought into your process if you can get them to have the insights. Uh, you know, you don't want to go away and have all these insights and then come back and like throw it at them. I'm going to go, I'm going to move on to the next one. Just, I'm just cognizant of the time. And we have two more fabulous mashups to talk about. So the other one is um, uh, that we use quite a bit now is scenario planning. So scenario planning is actually a, like a forecasting tool. It's a strategic planning tool where I've seen it used. Um, um, there's a, the, like the Institute for the Future. Um, is all really big on scenario planning. And it's, it's a tool that people use when they go in and they, and they help, 
you know, organizations um, solve you know, these sort of wicked problems about their, their future. It's a way that you, you can tell four different plausible stories about an organization's future. And we use this now instead of personas. Because I find, unless it's a marketing person that I'm dealing with, people really don't get personas. Like if I, if I work up personas in the traditional way, and I think personas are so useful and so necessary for the design process, but usually I'll show personas to a client and they can't, they, they, if it's not exactly, like they can't understand that it's like almost like a model, um, they'll, they'll get really nitpicky about little details. So we now we use this, so I'll explain what I mean. So the first thing I'm going to do is explain what scenario planning is, how that process works. So let's just imagine that we're doing not anything having to do with web design. Pretend we're the Institute for the Future. We're doing a forecasting exercise for Acme. Acme Inc. is, uh, is this company. So um, Acme Inc., you know, maybe they make, um, they make widgets. So you would find out from Acme Inc., um, what are the most um, critical things, critical factors um, impacting their future? So um, with Acme Inc., it might be uh, that they're negotiating a contract with their union of knights. So the most critical factor that's going to determine their future success is the outcome of this union contract with, uh, with the knights. And then the most uncertain, you, you also find out what is the most uncertain thing about your, your, the business. And so for Acme Inc., maybe it's um, the price of hydras. You know, they, they do a lot of work with um, the buying and selling of hydras. Um, and this is maybe the, the price of hydra is very uncertain. They don't know if it's, it's going to fluctuate wildly like oil or if it's going to be like really high, really low. And then you map these critical factors on an axis. So you say, okay, pretend there's a scenario where we get a really favorable contract with the Knights, like they're going to be working for almost nothing, yay. Or maybe we get a really unfavorable contract with the Knights. Um, so that's the critical one. You map that on an axis and then you map the uncertainty on an axis. So you say, okay, maybe Hydra are going to be super cheap. Maybe they're going to be very expensive. And then that enables you to tell four different stories of what might happen. So I just love this tool anyway, because it's sort of, it's like the crystal ball. It's like a, being able to look into the future. The way we use this in our design practice is we mash it up with personas. So we find out what is the most uh, critical factor, the critical characteristic of the users that are, are going to be using the website or, or whatever it is, and then also what is the most uncertain. <laughs> and we, we kind of use it, rather than create personas per se, we, look, we create roles. We're able to create four plausible user stories that kind of describes the world of users for a website. So this was one project that we worked on. And we did a fair bit of primary and secondary user research. Like we looked at their Google Analytics. Um, we got some, some users in a room. And we asked them a bunch of questions about their attitudes um, towards media, towards the news. How did they consume the news? It was a, um, a news website. And, and we figured that the most um, critical factor um, about the users of this website was um, how old they were, actually. Because there seemed to be a hugely uh, divergent way of um, consuming the news, depending on if they were young or if they were old. Like we had, um, uh, and I say this as an older person, um, a lot of the older people that we spoke to and that we looked at um, got all their news from the radio and the newspaper still. Um, uh, and then the younger users were more using um, not only online, but uh, getting it from social media, RSS feeds. So this was important. And then it was a, a community religious uh, media organization. So um, the most uncertain thing was how religious are the users going to be? Because it was a wide spectrum from people who were not really religious at all to people who were very religious. So we were able to kind of map out um, 
the universe of users and tell four stories about who these users might be. What? <laughs> I have 15 minutes. I'll talk faster. Um, and uh, and it, it, it feeds really nicely into um, uh, a re like an agile process where you start with user stories and then you work those up into kind of like a journey map. So it fed really well into being able to work up different journey maps um, depending on different user types and even to think about different um, ways that they could um, personalize the, their website experience for different users by kind of getting a bead on which world that user might belong to. Does anyone have any questions about that? So just to clarify, what you did was you created scenarios based on the um, critical factors in the most uncertain yes. people, right? Yeah. So now you've got four scenarios, and then from each scenario you created, basically you led to the persona. It, it does lead to a persona, but it's more of a role in a way, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, precisely. So, um, it, it, in, yeah, the output is kind of a persona, but it's, a, it's more of a role. It's more of a story um, than a profile, yeah. in a way. Um, and it, uh, it seemed to resonate better with the client. Like, rather than um, present them with uh, just a typical persona with the name and the photo, it, 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 it just immediately created these stories, um, which was a little bit easier for them to absorb. And it resonated with them as well because... Um, because they could see w w the process. So rather than them say, get really picky about something like, well, uh, none of our users are like that. They were able to kind of go, yeah, I kind of get that range. I, I see that. that. So I had a question over there. How, did they know what their critical and uncertain factors were, or did you guys help them figure that out? We, we figured that out, but we figured that out, as I said, we did a lot of primary and secondary research. So we, um, you know, primary research, we had, we did a, f a focus group. We got a lot of users in a room um, and asked them tons of questions. Um, we looked at their Google Analytics. Um, we looked at what words people were searching on their site, what search terms were leading to the site, where the referrals were coming from. We looked on Facebook to kind of get a sense of this particular community uh, in general. Um, and, and that's kind of what flowed out of it for us, was figuring out those critical and uncertain. But we could have done it with the client. We could have involved. And they immediately said, yeah, that makes sense to us. If they had looked at it and said, no, that doesn't make sense, then we probably would have needed to go into more of an exercise of working with them to say, OK, what do you think is the most critical? and the most uncertain factors. But it's not really the most critical and most uncertain factors about their business at this point. It's the most, this is where the mashup comes in, it's the most critical and uncertain characteristics of their user group, of their audience. Make sense? I'm gonna go to the last one, um, because then I can just leave a, a time at the end for questions. So the last one is, it kind of goes back to one of the questions at the beginning about involving people. So um, we always try to talk to um, like the people on the ground, like the people who are doing the work. And because usually, um, you know, for example, this uh, community newspaper project they had a lot of business process issues as well. So for them, the, their, their inroad into the project was, we need our website redesigned. Our website is really bad. But really, they needed a, a, a bit of a makeover on their, um, their business practices because they were very good at producing a newspaper once a week, but they didn't have the staffing model or, or any of the editorial practices to be involved in the 24-7 news cycle, which is sort of what you really 
yeah, they needed a new website because their website looked bad, but they needed a bit of a, an overhaul in all of their um, internal processes, you know, editorially, the way they were managing their content, their publishing cycles, all of that. So it was really important that we speak to all the, the people on the ground. So this um, purpose to practice is, is, I kind of have been replacing that. Does anyone do like a client interview at the beginning of a project? You know, you have your client interview and you ask them like, what technologies do you use? And what are some websites you like? And, and those are all great questions. Um, but I've been trying to wrap my client interview in this methodology. So I got this from, um, uh, there's this, I don't even know what to call it. I guess they're process design, meeting design practices called liberating structures. It sounds kind of woo woo, it's not at all. So people use these liberating structures to facilitate organizations through change. Um, they're used a lot in the healthcare industry when, you know, when they're trying to figure out, you know, how do we get people in, um, in the aftermath of SARS, how do we get people in hospitals to wash their hands? So, um, you know, facilitators are hired, they go in and they use these liberating structures to help uh, the people in the hospital to make that change. So purpose to practice, I didn't make it up, it's, it is a liberating structure. I totally invite you to go look on the website. They're, they're kind of meeting design uh, processes, but I kind of put, have put this around my client interview now. So I always start with, uh, with their purpose. And even if I'm talking to um, like a content manager or a webmaster or the person who does the social media, it really helps to establish trust. And I get way more out of them. Like I get all the, I get all the stuff I need about the website, but I get it in a better context because they feel like they're being heard. They feel like I care about what they're doing because I do, because I am really trying to solve their problem. So it's, um, it's a good structure within which to kind of ask all your questions. So, and it's very processy because again, as I said, it's usually business processes that, and back end things that we're trying to fix, help them fix. So ask them their purpose. Why is the work that you do important to you and the larger community that you serve? Um, often I'll ask them in that area in that first um, upfront time, um, tell me a story about the last time you were really happy with the work that you did. And what's super interesting and what I never get when I talk to the marketing people or the managers, the people on the ground always talk about collaboration. They always talk about, you know, my, I did some of my best work when we got to work on that project with that other department. And sometimes you'll never hear that if you only talk to the managers, they're all about like, keeping things in their own silo. And um, so this is a really great way to really see like what's really going on in the organization. Um, then I ask some principles, what rules do you have to obey in pursuit of your purpose? So they'll tell me all their processy stuff in there. Um, who has to be included for you to achieve your purpose? So who do you work with? Who are your coworkers? What, what's part of that process? Um, how, how do you organize? How are things organized to sort of distribute control? Um, and then, um, and then you, the actual practices. So um, this has just been a really great structure. Like I sort of have popped all my sort of client interview questions inside this structure and I've gotten some very good results um, from people. Well, sometimes it, you kind of keep going around. Like sometimes you get to the end and they'll have insights right. and they'll say, well, actually, you know what? I didn't really, it's like that coaching thing. It's like just by letting them talk and asking them the right questions, sometimes they get to the end and you're saying, so, so how, um, how are you gonna do? What, how, how could you be doing what you do differently? Then they'll go, yeah, you know what? Actually, I think, um, I probably should be doing this. And, and they'll talk it through and they'll, they'll kind of tell you everything that you need to know. Um, so really by mashing up all of these different methodologies with our sort of standard um, UX design practice, we're more participatory, we're more human centered. And this is again, that sort of that coaching thing. When, you're, when you kind of let your clients have all the insights, when they're having all these insights all along, they're, um, 
you get buy-in, you generate trust, but it's, it's actually way easier to solve the real problem, um, which just means better outcomes for everybody. So I think we have a bit of time for questions. Five? OK. Yes, all of these are discovery activities. Yeah, absolutely. And the card sort, I would usually do, if not at the end of the kickoff meeting, like the next meeting. Because sometimes the kickoff meeting isn't really a kickoff. Sometimes it's like just kind of getting to know, you know. So often what I would do is I would, I would structure the kickoff meeting in that purpose to practice kind of a model, um, and then do the card sort at the end of that meeting or in the next meeting? Uh, yes? How much time do these type of, uh, I guess, thought and modeling processes take? Um, I mean, the purpose to practice is like the interview. So I would usually interview, try to interview important stakeholders for a, about an hour. Sometimes it's, I can do it on the phone. I prefer to be sitting beside them, then they can show me stuff, but sometimes that's not possible. So I might end up spending a day on interviews, right? Because you want to get different people, sometimes more. I've had projects where it ended up, you know, and then that spreads out over elapsed time. We might end up spend, spending two to four weeks on discovery. We usually set aside a good chunk of time for a kickoff meeting, um, but again, depends on the client. The card sort takes, can take 20 minutes, uh, sometimes 40 minutes. Sometimes not even. So you're done in a day. You could be, but realistically, I guess the thing um, that I didn't mention about design is, um, you know, these aren't like um, tools where you you do it and uh, you do it. It takes an hour, and you walk away with your outcome. Like you, there's synthesis, right, in design. So you have to you have to let you have to allow time for your brain to synthesize everything that you've heard. Like, um, you know, the scenario planning in particular is a longer process. Like, we've, we do usually a fair bit of user research before we're ready to say, OK, I think we've figured out what is the most critical, what is the most uncertain, so we can sort of tell those stories. And sometimes we don't get it right the first time. So it, is it really then the purpose to practice uh, cycle that starts to uh, uh, generate some of the UIX and uh, uh, content uh, architecture. Or, see, I'm trying to map the, uh, these processes into, you're, you're really being hired to do web design, ultimately. Uh, how do you get uh, these processes feeding into those? Uh, uh, so the purpose to practice is basically just how I structure my client interview. So you're going to do that client interview no matter what. It's a good way to structure it and make sure that it's a way of just asking them questions where you're going to get better insights than asking them, what are some websites that you like, and that kind of stuff. So that's just that. Um, the scenario planning is basically that's our persona generation tool. So whatever is your, your user um, research process, we're still doing all that stuff. Like we're not, we're still uh, talking to users, looking at the Google Analytics, all of that. So that's actually the, uh, and always is a very time consuming process. And then the card sort is just like a little, I just do it with every client. And it's, it's usually very early in the process. And it, it feeds into the message architecture and the design. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Sort of. making a change in their organization or their target client or something? Or are you there to crystallize what they're doing and make their uh, expression of that clearer? Often, uh, yes, uh, so mm -hmm. to the second thing. So as uh, you know, usually they, what they say is, we just, we want to redesign our website. but. It's usually more than that. 
it's usually something about it because their website a website's not a brochure right like a website for most people it's their it's their business it's their digital business i mean um it's it's as important as um you know if i'm in a restaurant as all the processes around taking orders and fulfilling those orders and you know making sure that the waiters and waitresses don't like crash into each other like there's for for most businesses their website is a it's a lead generation tool it's a um, it can be where people actually buy the stuff that they make so it's it's usually more about their their business there's usually some problem there that they need solving so so you're hired to be part of the transformation of the problem solving for this business issue not merely the technology is that what you're saying yeah sometimes they don't know that I'd say most, of the time. most of the time they don't know it yeah, yeah. Um, expanding on, on what you were just saying pragmatically how do you approach a client um, with the idea that they're looking for someone who's going to design their website, and you end up uh, discovering that there were business process problems, and that they actually have to rebuild. How do you, um, from a business standpoint, give them a proposal to work with? Um, that's a good question. So, so, so I usually just try to tell them up front. Like I usually try to be clear that. Um, um, what what we're going to do um, and I usually try to be clear and you can look at my website and tell me if it's working but that we do a fairly significant discovery process and some clients it doesn't work and honestly then I don't want to work with them like I actually did have someone tell me I, I pitched and they got back and they wanted some changes and I pitched again and they came back to me and said you know we don't need to do all that user stuff up front because our users don't have any choice they have to use our website so I was like well, you know what? Um, I, I don't. I, I don't want to work on that project because I'm. I we do user-centered design. Right. So when you're um, pitching to them, how much work do you do up front um, before you actually pitch? Like you said, you they asked you more, and you went back and put some more into the proposal, went back. How much effort? And yeah. Effort if it's a, if it looks like it's a fairly lucrative project, you I would do a fair bit of yeah. I mean, I don't know if anyone pitch bids on tenders and that kind of stuff. Like, you can spend like 20, 30 hours yeah, on it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a very interesting discussion because this uh, business part is pretty critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, something called the business model canvas. Yeah, totally. Yes. Your question to that's In my master's, one of my classes, that's our textbook. Really? Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Questions actually, like the, you know, yeah, the pur purpose to practice. Yeah, I, I'm sure they do. Absolutely, practice. I've used the business model canvas with people too, for sure, just to clarify. Like, because sometimes, again, they think it's their, they think the problem is their website, but sometimes the problem is like you don't know what you're doing, like right. you don't know what you're doing in your business. <laughs> yeah, like your business is completely unclear. So, well, my question was, Bring that into every situation or in certain cases? No, it depends. It, it depends. It, that's, uh, honestly, that's the most challenging thing I find about working in this space. Every project is completely different, right? Every client is different. They all have different needs. So I think that's another reason why you can't walk in. There's no cookie cutter. You, Sarah, was all go over here. Mm. So, do you make that part of your work and advise them on that, or how do you incorporate that into your workflow? Yeah, so for them, that we were specifically hired, that was part of our work. And, and I think um, the reason they hired me was because I had worked at TVO for so long. I'd worked on the agenda with Steve Pakin and, and been running the interactive department when that show started and when we set up their website and all their business processes. So um, I was kind of like resting on my laurels there a little bit. So they knew that I had done that work and that's, and they knew that they knew they needed some changes. Um, so that was part of, and in fact, on that particular project, we're not doing the actual dev. 
we're, we, our work stops at sort of the wireframes and the design. So we're working with the developers, but my company's not doing it. So it's kind of perfect because I can make up all kinds of stuff. So I, w I wouldn't do that to someone. No, like we always do this. Like we, we ba I, I usually try to be really clear that we're very UX focused, user experience design focused, user centered design, participatory design focused, like that that's our process. But honestly, costing, I, I think even Avery and Lynn had said in their session, like it's kind of like how long is a piece of string? It depends on the client. It's sort of like, okay, how much do you have? So if I only, um, if we only have a couple of days to do user research, then we probably won't do a focus group. Like we probably will limit how much primary user research. We might do all of our user research from Google Analytics. And then they'll be like, oh, we don't have Google Analytics. So they'll be like, okay, well, we're gonna do mo I'm gonna be doing most of my user research on Facebook and on just like, it, it may not be perfect and it won't be as extensive. Whereas say for the newspaper client, it was a big part of it. So we, we did a lot of user research right. and spent a lot of time. So it's kind of like you can, but we always do a discovery process, always, with the same set of activities, a bunch of which I didn't even talk about. I mean, I only talked about three mashups, but we always do a content audit. We always do, like, there's always stuff we always do. And sometimes I get it wrong. You know, they'll say, I only have this much, can you do this? And I'll be like, yes, I can. And then I realize like, oh my God, I'm thinking one particular client that Jem will know what I'm talking about, where like the content audit alone took longer than the time allotted for the entire project. It was such a gigantic, I, I, I must have been desperate or something when I said yes <laughs> to that one. But I should probably wrap it up so the next person can get ready. No, 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 no. Oh, for lunch.